All right. So today, one of the biggest brands on the planet has entered Web3. And honestly, this is a brand that has always led the way from a technology standpoint, um, whether it's the app ecosystem or otherwise. Starbucks has always been known for on the cutting for being on the cutting edge. And the team behind Starbucks's um, Odyssey program, which is going incredibly well, is a team from Forum 3. And so Joe from Forum 3 has uh, graciously decided to come on and answer some questions, not only about not only about the actual Starbucks project, but also about uh, his company and what they're doing at Forum 3 and how they're thinking about technology and loyalty and the intersection of this new economy. So thanks for joining us, Joe. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Jesse. I'm looking forward to the chat, talking Odyssey, talking Web3, talking tech. I can't wait. So you've been in this space. I mean, I talk to a lot of founders or executives like yourself in this space, but very few of them have been in as long as you have. How did you first get into, I guess, what we're now kind of calling Web3? Yeah, my uh, it's funny. I've I've always kind of been a little bit of a degen at heart and i actually entered the web3 crypto space back in 2017 via the way of sports betting and so at the time i was you know big into uh sports wagering and there was all this you know it wasn't the same the market there wasn't the same as it is now in the sense that it wasn't regulated like it is and you know so you, you had trouble depositing on certain websites and they actually were only taking bitcoin at the time so that's what caused caused me to open up my first Coinbase account. And at the time, Coinbase only had Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Ethereum on it. And you got all your information from Reddit. And I was by buying Bitcoin to deposit onto a sports book. And then I would take it off. It would sit in my account. And that time, it's funny, it's actually six years ago, almost to the day. I think my first wow. Bitcoin purchase was May 7th of 2017. And so we had just, we just passed it. And um, so I would like <laughs> make a wager. I would pull it out. It would sit on Coinbase. And that was the run from like 1200 to like 3000 for that first time. And so I would like have it in there and number was going up and I'm like, man, I should probably understand what the heck this stuff is. And so I went down the rabbit hole and never came back. And, um, you know, quickly after that in 2018, I started podcasting. So I started creating content around, um, just crypto in general, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and that has parlayed into this role. So, you know, as we sit here and we're kind of in these this bear market time, it's a cycle that I've been through before. We had the same thing happen in kind of 2018 through 2020, and it was almost two years. And, um, you know, it's a hard time when things like this are happening to stick around, right? And so my my advice to people is always like, just be here, right? And so the podcast at the time and creating content was my way of sticking around and really staying involved in the space, continue learning, participating. And that's parlayed me into everything that, um, you know, I'm doing now. You know, what's awesome about that, Joe, because what I, I try to tell folks is, yeah, if you have never been through a cycle before like this, you know, honestly, I'm more comfortable in these cycles uh, because all the noise kind of disappears. Totally. What people don't understand is right now there's access. Like you can actually go and talk to people that honestly, five years from now are going to be so busy and they're going to be running such massive organizations that it's going to be impossible. And so going to the meetups and things like that, you can actually get to know folks and learn at, at such a higher clip than when there is, a you know, whatever, a thousand X amount of people at any of these events and different things like that. And so now it's kind of the ch your chance to really get to learn from the best, in my opinion. That that really, really resonates with me specifically because it's how I ended up where I am today. Right. So like, you know, at that time, the idea of being in crypto or web three full time meant you were either a developer or a trader. And those were like your only options at the time. And there wasn't businesses being built on the back of this technology that allowed for non-technical people to really be involved. And so, you know, you kind of had to bide your time and it was sometimes discouraging, but the fact, the access piece is really important because what I was doing in, you know, 
the NFT bull run was really just learning in public. And so I was just sharing what I was learning about play to earn gaming on my Twitter timeline and uh, creating content and podcasts. And, you know, that got enough attention from the right people that got me into some rooms that quite honestly, I felt like I didn't belong in at the time. Right. And so um, I, I can't tell you how much that resonates with me. And my one piece of advice, you know, if you take anything away from anything I say, in this is, is just start learning in public and start don't be afraid and that access piece is so incredibly spot on because you know there's not when you're in these nascent technologies like you see it happening here with ai too where it's now having its moment and you can get access to people that normally you shouldn't be able to get access to and and it's because you're early and everybody's learning at the same clip you know i love that and and you know it's amazing that you came in and started making content because in essence, you came in and you're learning, but you're also going, how do I create value? So you're creating, it's almost like I'm in, I'm taking in all this information. I'm going to distill it down and kind of give it back and hopefully it helps you. And so next thing you know, you're at, I mean, Forum 3. And honestly, what you guys are doing at Forum 3, uh, I don't know if there's, I mean, you guys are the standard. Like, I don't really know. And the fact that you're this far out in front, because what, what you guys are doing with Starbucks, and I know that you also, it looks like you added Boston Globe and you're starting to add more and more to your roster. Uh in my opinion, this is just what every brand has to do. So, you know, some of the stats that I always talk about that people are probably tired of me hearing, you know, from me about is like of the top 100, uh, you know, consumer facing brands in the world, 40 of them are already in the space. And in my opinion, the other 60 are already building, right? Um, Boston Consulting Group is pegging the uh, tokenized global digital assets within seven years at a $16.1 trillion market. So that's 10% of global GDP. So, what you're going to see, and there's all these rumors and really interesting stuff that we're hearing from Amazon, yada, yada, yada. Like, honestly, a year from now, this, in my opinion, what you guys are doing, everybody will go like, will be obvious. But it obviously wasn't obvious to anybody except for you guys when you started. So how did how did Forum 3 happen? Like, what were y'all seeing that meant they go, hey, we're not going to just do this for ourselves. We're going to build a platform. Yeah, it's, the story of Forum 3 is so awesome and interesting and it, it's kind of doubly as interesting with my my personal journey and so i as i mentioned got into the space in 2017 uh was creating content the nft kind of boom of top shot was happening in in 2021 early in like the january february 2021 i actually pivoted my podcast from a crypto focus show to an nft slash digital collectibles focus show because for me i would actually come from being a physical collector i'd come from you can see my sneakers in the background i have my sports cards i feel you on that i've got i've got my babe ruth baseball right here oh, so like i real? got yeah and so i wow. i came from like a physical collecting space and so as soon as i figure as soon as i had seen nfts for the first time in 2018 2019 uh right when like the 721 standard was just coming out i immediately understood the value of digital ownership and yeah. unique digital ownership and what you could do from a like a collectability standpoint and, and things like that and so you know, when the NFT boom was happening, that's when I pivoted my content. And I was specifically at that time really interested in play to earn gaming. And so I was doing a ton of stuff with Axie Infinity. And that's where I was really just sharing content about what I was doing in the game and, and what my thoughts were about like those ecosystems. I got, because of that, I got invited by a gentleman named Drew Austin, who is founder of a project called Knights of Degen. He's a VC in the space as well. And he was having a retreat at his house in uh, Warwick, New York. And so he hit me up on Twitter and he was like, Hey, I've seen your, your tweets. Uh, would you, would you be interested in joining us for this couple day retreat we're having out at that house and just talking about play to earn gaming to people. And he sent me the, you know, guest list of people that were coming. And that's where I was like, Oh, I don't belong in the same room as these folks. And so I was like, all right, I have to go. I have to get there. And I was like, what, what weekend is it? I'll be there. And he's like, Oh no, it's next Tuesday. I'm like, Oh, like, don't you guys work? <laughs> like, and so he, uh, I, but I knew I could just understand that it was an opportunity I couldn't miss. And so, uh, the, 
don't try this at home results. A typical thing that I did was I actually quit my job on the Friday before this thing. Really? I quit, I quit my job to go to Drew's house at Drew's house. I didn't know anybody there. I'd never met them before in my life. And at Drew's house is where I met Adam. And Adam is my co-founder at Forum 3. He's the former chief digital officer of Starbucks. And that's where we met. And I took that kind of calculated risk wow. and it paid off for me. Uh, but when I met Adam that day, him and I immediately hit it off, especially around this idea of play to earn gaming. And that's kind of where our original thesis around Forum 3 came from. And we were really fascinated with the mechanics of, you know, tokens or NFTs as digital rewards, but we were very obviously um, observant of kind of how, what the downfalls in these current economies were, right? So like we've seen kind of what happened to Axie Infinity up, yeah, down, Axie, and, yeah. mm -hmm. and it just, the incentives didn't align, right? Because, and, and so what was happening at that time that we were seeing was, these economies that were being built were super extractive and they were all funded by the user, right? So user buys assets, user funds the economy, they're rewarded back for their work in the ecosystem with these tokens and everybody is in a rush to ROI and sell their tokens. And that's when the whole thing crumbles and it doesn't work. And so very quickly, we kind of reframe this as, okay, well, what if you took that same reward system, the reward mechanics there and, and put it in a different framework that is supported by an entity or a brand that can create and already has that inherent value and it doesn't need the customer to fund the ecosystem. Right. And so that's kind of where our initial ideas came from around um, how you could take NFTs and web three and, and create a reward system and a loyalty layer around it. And so we were really born from this idea of play to earn gaming and kind of everything that we do is with that lens and loyalty is it's, it's very much kind of a play to earn type of thing. And really everything is X to earn when you think about it. And so, you know, with what we've done with Starbucks, which we'll get into, you know, we really focused on that earn side and how you could take an existing brand and kind of share that value back uh, with the customer and the consumer and create a totally new experience. And that's where we started and, and why, what our thesis was. You know what's crazy? As soon as you said that, I was like, "Of course, that's your guys' background." It makes so much <laughs> sense, right? Because I'm looking at I'm looking at the what you guys are building. I'm like, "This was this makes a ton of sense." But that connection piece, it's like, got it. And then leveraging the brand that already has value, that already has you know some sort of mechanism like this. But what I think is awesome is you're bringing actual ownership to this. Because a lot of people, when you say digital assets, they go, yeah, yeah, I understand. And I own digital assets. It's like, you rent digital assets. Mm -hmm. you, you don't actually own any digital assets until totally. now. Um, so you've got this idea, like you and Adam have this idea and you go, hey, I think this would be really interesting to brands. Well, I mean, how did that evolve from there? Because like, again, Starbucks is known for coming out and leading the way on a lot of this stuff. Um, what was it about what you guys were doing that they saw and went, yes, we want, we want to work with you on this. Yeah. So this is really interesting as well. And so obviously we as form three, because of Adam's background and relationships, we're very uniquely positioned to, um, have this dialogue with Starbucks. Right. So, but what's, what's funny is at the time, Howard Schultz was not the CEO of Starbucks and he, and so we, but Adam obviously has a personal relationship with Howard. So Howard was interested just in general in what forum three was doing. And so, um, he took an interest in what we were doing. We had just Adam and Andy, who's our other co-founder had a lot of discussions and uh, dinners about just web three in general with Howard. And, um, when he did go back a couple months later, just very totally serendipitously, not premeditated or pre-planned, he went back as CEO and said, Hey, let's do this. And it was really interesting because at that point, and this is honestly, our, our, you're hitting us on a lot of milestones. So we went out to Starbucks for the first time to kind of educate on web three, almost a year ago today. 
And wow. it, it was like a year ago next week is when we first went out there. And so this is a really important part of the story, I think. And we went out, we flew out to Seattle, went to their headquarters. And our, our idea was not to pitch Starbucks Odyssey. Our idea was to educate the teams on what Web3 was, what NFTs were, and how they might be able to leverage that technology to do something. And so we met with a bunch of the cross-functional teams. We met with, uh, you know, their educate, their coffee education team. We met with their marketing team. We met with the partnerships team, all the stuff. And we met with the loyalty team and immediately they saw the value in this and the loyalty team from Starbucks just been so incredible to work with. And it's partially because immediately they understood kind of what the value proposition here was. And they said something to us in that first initial meeting, which was really interesting. And they said that they'd been looking for something like this for a long time. And mm. when you, break that down as to why it's really interesting. If you think about what the current loyalty system is in the app, right? You've got this, uh, incredible app, mobile app where, uh, you've got 30 million monthly active users and, uh, it's one of the most successful loyalty programs on the planet. And then they said, Oh, we've been waiting for something like this. And that makes you really think about, well, why? And, if you if you break it down, the current loyalty program is very transactional. It's very linear, right? It's it's a value proposition of I give you incremental spend as a customer or incremental visits, and you give me essentially what equates to discount, right? Very transactional, very single player, very one way. When you take this idea of uh, and and there's also a real cost associated to everything you do in a program that scale when everything is is essentially discount line right mm -hmm. and so when you think about and and what's crazy is they have so much data on all of these users in terms of um surveys on what they like and dislike about the program what they would like to see as the program advances things like that and what was really interesting was in that data their top loyalty customers were telling them things that they that they want from the program that very much resemble what you can get out of an nft and web3 community rather than like, like give me, can you give me an example joe like what do you mean sure like experiences or uh or community or recognition or things like that and things that they couldn't do inside the existing loyalty program from both a capability standpoint and also a cost standpoint, right? Like everything becomes economy of scale or like very cost prohibitive to do incremental things within a program that size. And it it's very hard to do at an individual level as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when they said, Hey, we've, we've got all this data on customer feedback of what they want to see from our program it was very easy to to connect the dots of like, okay, here's what Web3 enables. It's almost that just perfect for Web3. It, it exactly was. And so they got it right away. And so that was kind of the, and, and like I said, we didn't go there pitching Starbucks Odyssey. We went there educating. And I think that's the important takeaway. If you're thinking about, you know, how to interact with brands on this stuff. It really, really, really requires a ton of, of education from kind of top down. And um, because, you know, we know it very well and then we live it and breathe it, but it's not like that everywhere. And so it requires a lot of education, but yeah, that's kind of how the initial story was. That was almost a year ago today. Wow. And uh that same trip, which is interesting, like I said, we didn't go there pitching Starbucks Odyssey, but we did leave there with the idea of Starbucks Odyssey. And um, Adam meant, uh, went to have a meeting with uh, the CMO, Brady, and he left myself and Morgan in a conference room. He's like, I'll be back in 90 minutes. And uh, in that conference room, it was the two of us and 20 whiteboards. And when he came back, the whiteboards were full. And we had kind of the bones of what ended up being Starbucks Odyssey, which was pretty cool. It's like my wow. 
career, like, you know, start yourself in a garage type of moment. I still have pictures have of the pictures whiteboards. Of yeah, I do. I have pictures oh, of the whiteboards. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's amazing. But yeah. I love that. So, so you start this program. Um, when did you go, okay, we can solve this problem for Starbucks, but obviously you were going, wait, but this really needs to be a platform. Can you talk to me why the platform was important to you? Yeah, I think there's a lot of reasons that you would need to build a platform. And I think the main one for a brand like Starbucks is you have this this kind of legacy program that has 30 million users in it. And you want to build something for those users, right? It's not necessarily an entirely new audience you're building for. And so how do you bridge the gap between Web3 technology and the very easy way they interact now on the Starbucks Rewards app, right? And so the only way to do that is by building the platform because the you know, trying to have my mom set up a MetaMask wallet with private keys and go to OpenSea for a drop or to purchase her Siren NFTs or whatever doesn't work really well. And so there's this, this user experience that needs to be built when you're talking about an enterprise consumer product at that level it needs to be kind of really easy or as easy to use as possible. And then there's also the idea that when you're building a rewards program and we wanted to, we thought this was a non-negotiable of, of what we wanted to accomplish, which was meeting people where they are, right? So like you don't want to take them outside of their current coffee buying habits. You want to meet them there and give them something additional for that. And so uh, the way to do that is actually tying their activity together, right? So when you log into Starbucks Odyssey, you're actually logging in with your current Starbucks rewards credentials. So that API talks directly to your Starbucks rewards account on your app and your Starbucks Odyssey account. And so everything you do from a transactional level can then be tracked and rewarded inside of Odyssey. So there's, we're really the big two reasons why we needed to build a platform. If you just launched something through a contract, you didn't have that connectivity, uh, which you know, we thought was absolutely imperative because you want to make this incremental and not totally separate and siloed. And then obviously ease of web three use, right? So there's like this kind of web two and a half um, idea that happens inside Odyssey where you log in, you do not need to set up a wallet. You do not need to save a private key. You can participate as is. And when it comes time for you to kind of enter that marketplace, which we've already built inside, you're provisioned a kind of wallet. So it's a custodied wallet solution on the back end, And you never need to know how to use it or operate it aside from buying and selling in that siloed marketplace. However, if you are kind of Web3 native or Web3 curious, you also have the option to connect your self-custodied wallet and your points and stuff get tracked in there as well. So you could actually pull that out. You could self-custody it. You could put it on your ledger, your cold storage, your MetaMask, whatever. And you can go sell it on OpenSea or transact with it on those decentralized marketplaces as well. So we wanted to build an experience for both, uh, both existing customers and like both sets of people, the Web3 native and the, you know, Web3 new folks or just Starbucks fans in general. And then, but we wanted to give that option of kind of like Web3 curious or the ability to kind of graduate into self-custody because we saw this happen a lot with NBA Top Shot, right? NBA Top Shot was super easy to use. You could pay with a credit card. You had your account. You didn't need to really know anything on how to set it up. And it was just easy. And, but what happened was you got a lot of like people that are, that we now interact with every day in the ecosystem, that that was their first NFT experience. And as they kind of found what was outside of Top Shot, they moved, right? They they learned how to set up a MetaMask. They learned how to, uh, you know, interact in a decentralized way. And they kind of graduated from Top Shot to, uh, you know, 
a more decentralized option. So we wanted to give that option for people as well. I always joke around and say uh, it's, uh, I call it a mullet platform where it's web two in the front, web three in the back. And it, so it's the experience that, you know, you need to have for like somebody like my mother to use, which she does very often now. And, you know, but also um, the ability to kind of keep that decentralized feeling if you wanted it or needed it also. Okay, so here's I'll tell you a funny story about uh, what you guys are doing. It, I was at the I was uh, with a buddy of mine from Web three at the we were go, we were all in town for the people event, right? And we're at this like hotel, and he's looking at his he's like, let's go get coffee, and he's like, okay, well it's like six blocks away, and I was like, there's a coffee shop right there. He's like, dude, I gotta go to Starbucks because I gotta <laughs> get my stamps, and I was like, okay, that's interesting to me. The fact that like <laughs> totally. he was willing like. I'm going to go way down here out of the way right now. Granted, he's a Web3 person. So but when I saw that happen, I was like, this is catching like this is the fact that that's built into like his day, you know, is like, nope, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go through Starbucks. That kind of behavior that you're starting to get and see, I, I mean, it's hard for me not to think it's starting to really catch on, which is interesting. So so let's go to the top. Like, so what is Odyssey? Like what is yeah. Starbucks Odyssey? So it's a great question. And I think the easiest way to describe what Starbucks Odyssey is, is it's a kind of parallel path loyalty program. So you've got your traditional loyalty program that you run through your mobile app with your stars and that hasn't changed. So if you're a current user of that app, nothing about that is disrupted. It is there. You can still use it. Odyssey runs parallel. It's its own separate platform at the moment. So it's kind of a web, uh, it's a mobile friendly web app. And at the core, it's a gamified experiential loyalty platform. And so um, there, when you enter Odyssey, you, as I mentioned, you log in with your normal Starbucks credentials. So it's a, then innately uh, tied directly to your rewards app. So anytime that you do a transaction, it can be credited in both your rewards app, the legacy rewards app and your Starbucks Odyssey. Uh, but what you'll see is something that we call journeys. And journeys are kind of like these quests, if you will, right? And they're kind of like branded Starbucks authentic content, right? So your first quest, you come in and you might see the heritage journey. And this is to teach you kind of all about Starbucks heritage. And you'll do things like uh, take a virtual uh, 3D tour of their Costa Rican coffee farm, or, um, you know, take a quiz on where the origins of the coffee come from. And there's, so there's like, you know, some content, some mini games, some things like that. And then typically there's some kind of, uh, you know, coffee purchase experience that's tied to that. So for that, uh, coffee heritage one, for example, you, uh, buy a Starbucks coffee one uh, one a week for five weeks, and that completes that challenge for you, right? So you've got this kind of uh, dual thing happening where you're uh, immersing yourself in Starbucks as a brand through kind of their storytelling, through learning about their brand in an authentic way. And then it also meets your typical Starbucks purchasing activities, right? Like, you know, it's not buy five Starbucks in a day, it's buy one a week for five weeks, which is a pretty reasonable thing if you're a Starbucks goer, right? Or or if you're like me, you buy multiple in a day because you're a caffeine, a caffeine addict. <laughs> but the, uh, but yeah, so essentially that's what you'll see when you log in. There's all these journeys, you complete the journeys and you're rewarded with these stamps. Uh, the stamps are your digital collectibles. So these are actual NFTs and these stamps have points in the metadata. So that's an important point because what you said before was really interesting of like, oh, you don't own a digital asset, you rent a digital asset. And so in this context, you actually do own your loyalty, right? So if in, in relation just to the traditional loyalty app, right, your stars are essentially just a ledger of your transactions, right? There's no ownership, there's no ability to transfer, there's none of that. In Odyssey, when you earn your stamp, those stamps have points that are baked into their metadata, meaning that they are 
tied to that specific stamp. So if you buy or sell or transact on that stamp, if you're buying one, you're going to get credited with those points. If you're selling one, you're going to de be deducted those points. And why that's important is because for the first time, you actually own your loyalty and you can choose how you want to interact with that loyalty reward. So you've got your stamp. So the TLDR so far is you come in, you complete journeys, you earn stamps, those stamps have points. And inside of Odyssey, there's points levels. And as you earn more uh, stamps and you level up, those are going to give you ac access to very specific and special Starbucks benefits, right? So we, ju we just had our first benefit selection period. There were three tier levels. And if you were, uh, depending on what tier you were, you had three different options per tier as your first benefit. So for example, if you were at the highest level of this first benefit period, you could have selected um, two of the cool things were one free coffee for a month, which is pretty cool. So you could have had, which, which actually starts tomorrow. So, uh, you, you'll have 30 days of free coffee. And, uh, if you were there and selected that level of benefit or, uh, the one I chose, which was pretty cool was this very unique, uh, mirror Starbucks tumbler with my specific Starbucks Odyssey siren printed on it, which is cool. So now, uh, I can imagine that on your background sitting up on your yeah, top you uh, on That's the top right, of your thing. Yes. <laughs> I chose that one because you know, I chose, I was going to pick the free coffee and my wife was like, "No, no, no, you got to get the the tumbler. It's like a representation of what you helped build. It's the collectible blah blah blah." I'm like, "Yeah, you're right. I could just buy my coffee. I'll get the coffee next time." So, uh but yeah, so uh, the the TLDR there is you come in you complete journeys, you earn stamps, those stamps have points, you level up and those levels earn you your benefits. And so um, typically quarterly is when you'll see those benefit selection periods. And then on top of that, you might see additional rewards that are less structured, right? So some surprise and delight things like airdrops or um, claim discounts or things like that. And then there's a lot of cool stuff we've got going on inside the Odyssey community, which currently is held on Discord, which is um, really, really been a, a fun finding of all of this for the Starbucks team. So we can get into that if you want to, but that's the high level, what the Starbucks Odyssey program is. And so far it's been really, really awesome. That's awesome. So you go on journeys, you collect these stamps, the stamps have points, and then you can cash those points in for different things. But the cool thing about this is if I wanted to, I could also sell one of those stamps. Correct. Right? Yes. And so I remember, I think it was the first stamp you guys did. I remember hearing them going for, for over like a thousand dollars and stuff. So yeah. what's neat about this, because, because it's almost like all, everything you just explained, you can do in web two, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I go on these journeys, I get stamps, I get points. The difference, what you guys built is, or I can sell this stamp to someone else that wants to give me actual money or whatever for this, you, you, you are not only custodying these if you'd like, but they're actually you, when you say you own them, you get mm -hmm. to buy, sell, trade them. Right. Which is correct. Which is something that for most people is like the biggest kind of mind switch. Right. Which is kind of like, yeah, I can either just keep holding them exactly like you did and I can cash them in. Or if I want, you know, they're my stamps. Right. Yeah. So, so it's a great point. And I, I think that's the huge differentiator, right? There's a couple reasons of like why blockchain that we can get into if you'd like. Um, but that one is at the very high level, like basic level, the differentiator, right? So uh, think of it this way. I just explained this benefit selection period that's happening. And some of those benefits might be like really, really attractive to a certain user. And so let's use the Starbucks cups, for example. Uh, there's this entire rabid collector base of these Starbucks cup uh, enthusiasts. And, um, you know, there's people in our community that just have like your background all with the different limited yeah. release Starbucks Chile, cups. London, like all the places. Totally. And yeah. so, so that as a reward might be super, super attractive to somebody. But for you or me, you're like, mm, I'm not sure. I don't collect these cups. I don't really resonate with that as a reward, I'm actually going to sell my stamp. And so you've now created this interaction between somebody who 
is desiring that stamp because the question you always get when you talk about this is like, oh, sure, I can sell it, but like who would want to buy it and why does it matter and all of that stuff, which is a great question. But here's the answer is that the reward may mean something the perceived value of that reward to a certain user may be super, super high for them. And they're like, okay, I can go pick up this stamp and get to that tier to get that reward. Or it may not be as valuable to you. And you can say, eh, you know, I'm going to go put my stamp on the market. Some, and, and I'm getting value from that perspective as I've gone on this journey with Starbucks, doing my normal Starbucks activities for that. I've been rewarded with this thing that has intrinsic value to uh, not only me, if I want to use it for the reward, but definitely for somebody else because of the reward. And so I've done work inside the Starbucks ecosystem, if you will. Right. And I'm, I can choose you're rewarded for that, right. You're rewarded for it and you can choose how you want to use that. And by the a, way, you just, you just explained markets. So, yeah, right, so, yeah. <laughs> so like, like when you're talking about like, I'm a sneaker head. So as soon as I saw your sneakers, I was like, are those what I think they are right now? If somebody doesn't like shoes, they're just like, Oh, okay. Those are They're cool sneakers shoes. with a flower That's on how them, yeah. everything works, yeah. right? And so the fact that you've now created an economy where, where like, yeah, they went through the journey, they did the work, they have an asset. If that asset becomes very desirable from someone else, the fact that that upside goes to your customer is really, this is the stuff that I think once people get this, they'll, they'll realize how massive of a game changer digital ownership is because now they get to keep that upside, Right. Um, and the fact yeah. that this is all working, this isn't theory. You can go do this right now inside of the Starbucks ecosystem. Yeah. And I think that the really interesting point there is like this idea that you can own your loyalty in a way that is actually, you're, you're sharing the, for the first time, the brand is actually sharing that intangible brand value that they have, right? So what this actually is doing from Starbucks, and this is why it was attractive as, as a platform to Starbucks in the, in the beginning, right? Is like, you can actually now, what Web3 and NFTs unlock here is that intangible Starbucks brand value, right? So Starbucks, as one of the biggest corporations in the world, they have an intrinsic collectability to the things that they put out. They also have the ability to partner with anybody in the world from a, an artist, another business, anything like that. And in the past, that's all been kind of push marketing, right? Like it's all been kind of pushed at you with no value created for the user. It's actually a, a very transactional thing that they can do with that. But now I can, for the first time, share, it's a two-way value exchange of what I do for Starbucks, which is buy their coffee. And then what Starbucks, because of that value, and it goes all the way back to the beginning of this conversation about how the play to earn economies worked, right? Where there was no top-down value. It was all user in rush out. Now here you're talking about something that has this massive value as a brand, as a collectible, as something uh, that has meaning to a lot of people. And now you can share in that two-way value exchange for the first time. It's amazing. I mean, people don't understand what, how this is going to change things. Like for me, I think in the future, a, a, not only we already know the digital and physical is going to just be tied together. So when you buy the physical, you get the digital or other or vice versa. Right. But I, I'm a big believer that the digital is going to become worth a lot more to a lot of folks. So if you whatever you're at a cracking game and you buy the enhanced jersey and you also get the digital version that has the tag that says playoffs in 2023, that physical journey, you can go to the jersey, you can sell that on eBay or whatever. It gets damaged. But there's going to be people out there that just collect digital Kraken jerseys because they want to either have them custody them or use them in the metaverse and all this kind of stuff. And also they're pristine. And again, you get to leverage the benefit of the brand, like where you guys are going by, by in essence, taking a piece of the brand and actually giving it to the customer for them to really see the upside in. Um, it's hard for me not to think that every brand's going to kind of have to follow your guys's lead on this because once you get, I think the big thing is it's like classically, we make ama amazing things that we get paid in dopamine. Like Joe, go take all these incredible photos, put them in an app. We'll make billions of dollars and we'll pay you with likes, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
up to this point, everything's been renting. Oh, well, you bought that movie? You paid to buy that movie for $25 on Name the Platform? Great. If I bought this movie, I should be able to like let Joe watch it, right? Or I should be able to sell it to Joe if I'm done watching it. Oh, I can't do that. Oh, I'm buying it, but I never bought it. I'm renting it. What you're extending to people for the first time really is ownership over the loyalty incentives you get. And it's up to you. Like if somebody wants to offer you $100 for for that stamp, you can say no or yes or right. You've created a market and they get the upside. It's It's kind of one of those things like once you get it, you go, how did we ever get, how do we ever do it any other way, <laughs> right? Um, and, I, and I feel like what you guys are doing at Starbucks and just your platform in general is kind of tip of the spear for helping consumers realize, honestly, you've been expecting too little, in, in my opinion. Um, you've been yeah, expecting that's really too funny little. that you say that because I, I think of it as like the customer profile is changing and loyalty in the past has meant what you owe the brand, right? In the sense of like, yeah, of I buy Starbucks because I love Starbucks. Um, but in reality, I think it's changing to what the brand owes you, right? And and so like, just like you said in your, your example with your buddy uh, that walked six extra blocks, right? It's like, well, I could go, I could just go to this coffee shop, but why don't I, right? It's, it's, but it's now, oh, well, Starbucks is giving me something to come to their coffee shop, right? And so, and, and so it's changed the, because that's what the customer wants these days. It's, it's all about attention. It's all about incentives and it's all because like, I feel like as consumers, we've woken up a little, right. To, um, you know, especially in, in like web three, where we, we think that data is so important and valuable, our own data. And it's all the same thing, right? It's, it's my data, my money, my purchase history, my actions uh, that I take online, all of that stuff. And it's valuable. And so the more and more and more people recognize it's valuable, it means that their attention becomes valuable and all of that same thing. And that's where these loyalty incentives really are. And you also hit on a couple of things there with the Jersey example that I love about not only the digital physical, but this is one of the other reasons why I love the like why blockchain for this question. So I'll give an actual Starbucks example. Um, years ago, Starbucks did an initiative with the Seattle Mariners and they gave everybody these really cool collectible Starbucks Ichiro cards and they were physical cards. And who knows who has them now they're in somebody's desk somewhere and, or maybe on a shelf or whatever, but there's no connectivity there. There's no connectivity from the person who has that back to Starbucks. There's no connectivity from the person who is that to somebody else in Seattle who has that, that might be this massive Vitro fan and Starbucks fan that you could connect together. So there's something that's really interesting about that as a, um, not like a, not like a CRM, but just community. Right. And the fact yeah. that like, now I know everybody who has every program that we've ever run, right? Like I know who's got, who's completed X amount of journeys. And so I could say, Hey, look, you've now completed every journey that Starbucks Odyssey's ever done. And because of that, we're going to give you this exclusive offer that nobody else gets. Right. And yeah. like, or, Hey, by being in Starbucks Odyssey, you have access to this community of thousands and thousands of people that love Starbucks, that love coffee, that love art and culture and creating. And, and you're now making connections with people all across the country that you would never connected with before. And so there's okay, so, a lot so of interesting things there that, too. Joe, because I want to double click on the community piece. You know, I, I heard someone say that, you know, Web3 kind of at its essence is a community of people with the same aligned incentives. So um, one of my favorite artists, Nina Chanel Abney, she's, 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 you know, one of the biggest artists on the planet. I don't know, it's, a, it's something like a six year waiting list to get her paintings from museums. And but the reason she wanted to make a Web3 drop is because she's like, I want a community. Like, I want to yes. want to be able to connect with my fans and show them, here's what I'm excited about. And I got these new Beats headphones coming out. What do you guys think? And like, she's like, I wanted the feedback. I wanted a group of us to get together that all really like this stuff in this, you know, Discord environment where it's token gated so that I know it's also a safe place for me to come in and go, 
I have some ideas and I want to show this stuff to you guys first or, hey, there's this museum and it's going to be a bunch of really wealthy people, but I want you guys to come in and see my stuff first. And so, and I'm watching that. And for her, it was all about like, I want a community of people that also love this stuff and we're all united around it. Like, so when you started your Discord, I'm assuming, I don't, I never heard of Starbucks having a Discord. Did you start that for this program? Yeah. So very... I would say very slow and careful rollout of the community. And for, for a lot of different reasons, but mainly Starbucks has never had a community like this, a digital community like this. Right. And so um, there's a, and, and we wanted it to be very exclusive to only people inside the Starbucks Odyssey platform. And so we've, we kind of seeded it with a, an alpha group of, of alpha users and alpha testers. And we've kind of grown that as Odyssey has continued to grow. And you actually only get a invite to this discord community via email after you've been in the program for a couple of weeks. So uh, it's very methodical and thought out the way we've done this, but it's been an incredible experience for just both me to actually kind of run the community and Starbucks from a learning perspective. You're, you're connecting people from all around the country. You're getting this very um, close and consistent feedback loop of not only what's happening inside the Odyssey program, but just what people are seeing from Starbucks as a brand. And you're getting this really, really cool thing, which I will, will get to on like the forum three stuff, but like one of the craziest takeaways is user generated content, right? Like you've got real brand fans in there making things and creations, whether it's art, like we have, uh, one of my friends that I, that's in the community, her name is Vicky and she's a very talented artist with AI tools. And she comes into the discord every morning and drops her siren of the day and people love it. And it's the, and Starbucks loves it. And you've got, you've got, uh, other community members that are like mocking up merch and cups and like all these cool designs. And, and there, that's like been a very interesting find it, uh, finding for Starbucks of like, wow, there's really interesting feedback that's happening. There's like many to many that's happening and there's user generated content that's valuable and, and worthwhile that's happening. And so, um, you know, we're doing things inside of there. Uh, you know, we're having very, exclusive interviews. So we've got like this conversations over coffee event that we run monthly. And we've had like, uh, Adam was our first guest and, uh, we had Ryan Wyatt, CEO of Polygon in there. We had, and now we're going to be doing, we had the VP of loyalty from Starbucks as our first three events. And now we're kind of branching out to artists and, and just people that you know, the community finds interesting, but might not have access to anywhere else, which is cool. We've got a bunch of really cool community initiatives, like giving initiatives. And there's a lot of um, cool kind of incentives going on inside that community too. But it's been, I would say one of the highlights, if you, if, if Starbucks, if you were to ask Starbucks what their best experiences from Odyssey have been so far. I think they would tell you the community is, is absolutely a highlight. I mean, what, what brands owners. So when I'm talking to brands about this stuff, I'm like, I know it's scary to give up some control and to give up some ownership, but what you get back is staggering, right? When you bring people in and you give them a voice like that. I, I mean, if I've done this before where I'll be talking to a bunch of execs and I'll go, what's most successful startup in history. And they'll be like, I don't know, I'll be like, it's called Board Ape Yacht Club. And then people are like, say that again, Board Ape Yacht I go, yeah, you know, four friends got together. Their first goal is to pay back their moms. A year later, they're worth $4 billion. That's never happened before. That's what happens when you give a community ownership and you trust them to like kind of start to self-regulate and make things. Because the funny thing is you start to go, wait a second. So these folks are making content for us. They become our best salespeople. They become our best creative team. They become our best marketing team. And all we had to do was like allow them to own a piece of the brand. It's like everybody can win in this Web3 space. And so also how cool is it for that artist that's using the AI tools every morning? She's getting affirmation of like, keep going. We're enjoying this. And so she's going, I'm going to keep doubling down on doing this. And then next thing you know, who knows, the opportunities that can open up for her you know, with all those totally. other people in the room, because you don't know who your community is, you know, um, 
and also the access piece you're giving these folks. So now they get to ask questions about like how, the Polygon ecosystem. You're learning. And I mean, I'm a big believer that, you know, the Web3 kind of revolution that's happening right now, it already happened. People just don't know it yet. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that if you're inside the Starbucks ecosystem, you get to be on the front of that and you get to learn and be a part of the community, watch it grow, understand these patterns. It's gone from just like before kind of Web2 loyalty. Oh, I get a 15 percent discount on this hoodie or I get, you know, whatever, my next coffee for free. Now you're giving them, no, we're going to give them ownership. And we're not only giving them ownership, but once you have ownership, you're going to get a community of people united around that shared ownership. And we're going to continue giving access and information. And they're going to help us be smarter, better, all this stuff. And you did that within this one little ecosystem, which I think is just going to keep growing and growing. And so, um, I don't know, like in the Discord for you, what... I mean, you, you've you been in this space for so long. Like, what was the thing that surprised you? That So when you saw it, you're like, oh, man, I didn't see that happening, you know, either mm -hmm. this fast or what surprised you and really what made you go like, wow, this is going to work? I think like the community I knew was going to be a home run because I've seen them happen. I've created a bunch of these communities myself, like what we do with DJ Network. So I've seen it. I've seen the power of it. and. I was so adamant on, on like making sure we did this in a really authentic way to Starbucks and also, but like making sure we did it. Right. Cause you just said the, the, like, it's scary. Cause it is for, for brands to kind of give people a forum totally free form, essentially. Like we have moderators in there, but like it is a live chat. And so if somebody, you know, wants to come in and complain about their latte and they're in a Starbucks Odyssey, like in theory, they can. Right. And so I think like, uh, as a brand, that's what you're worried about. You're worried about what the, the, um, the worst case scenario is you're, you're worried about brand risk. You're worried about stuff like that. And, um, it's been so the opposite of, of that. And, and so what I, ex I, I expected this with the community, but I don't think Starbucks did. And what is the, I guess, fulfilling to me is that I think if you ask them, this would be one of the highlights of, of rolling out Odyssey and Odyssey, honestly, it couldn't happen without the community because, so this is okay. So this is one that I, didn't recognize was so important about having the community was it's new tech, right? So like stuff's going to break and you need that feedback loop of, Oh, this might be working for the broader issue, but there might be something that's broken and that might cause, you know, a wider spread thing. And there, there are things that we wouldn't have known about that weren't working without the community. Right. And so uh, like, it really helps build like when, when you said people are there at the ground floor building with us, that is, couldn't be more true. And I think that was what was most surprising to me about the community is people's willingness and patience to go on that journey with us, right? Because they feel part of it because we're asking them to be part of it. We're asking for their feedback. We're taking it, we're implementing it. And that part has been kind of magical to me. And like, you know, there's this daunting thing of like, oh, well, we got to launch a discord, right? Like, and it's, I wouldn't do it any other way without it. Like I wouldn't not have a community if you're a brand doing this stuff, because you have to give these people one central place to actually engage with the platform in a way that's authentic to them. And then two, that feedback loop is invaluable. That's amazing. Okay. So I know we're at time. I got one more question for you, Joe. So you have the, not only are you a tech founder, obviously, uh, you're about as one of the most connected guys in the space. You're a collector. You've been around as long as kind of even before what most people even consider the beginning of Web3. I always like to end the, by asking folks like yourself, like, in essence, what can you see that you don't think other people can see yet? Like there's in Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One, he said, what's the unpopular belief that only you have or a very small group of people have? Um, what is that for you? There's there's two things one it's it's that this whole paradigm of how a consumer interacts with the brand 
is changing before our eyes, like we talked about, right? This idea that loyalty is no longer like what I owe a brand, it's what the brand owes me, right? Like, I think that's happening. I think there's this other thing that the attention economy, all these brands are content companies, whether they see it or not, they have to be. And so Odyssey is a great example of this, where you're in this incredible environment of like authentic brand content that really deepens a relationship with the customer. A quick example, that Costa Rican coffee farm tour video that's existed for years and nobody watched it without the proper incentives. But as soon as they do, it's an incredible experience and you get the feedback of that. And every brand is going to need to realize that they're in the content game, whether they like to think so or not. And then lastly, it's how AI is also going to impact all of this. So this idea that you're giving ownership to people through a web three collectible and reward is one part of that. That's uh, I kind of mentioned at the top, that's the earn side, right? AI is going to change the play side. And so all of this stuff is empowerment tech, empowerment technology, right? I used that, uh, my friend Vicky, as an example earlier of somebody who, you know, is creating Starbucks content through her artwork that she was never doing before these tools came around. And um, that's going to happen more and more. And brands are going to need to lean into that that as well for this idea of consumer or customer generated content for them, right? Like it's a, it's a massive superpower when you activate a community like that. So I would say a combination of all those things is where I'm super focused. I think the ball, the puck is going. And, um, you know, I think that's what you'll see from us from form three in the future too. Well, congratulations on everything at form three and being on the cutting edge of all this. I've been watching what you guys have been doing in the Starbucks ecosystem, and I can't wait to see how the platform evolves. So thanks for your time, Joe. Thanks so much. This was great.